Hello everyone, my name is Peter Acosta. I'm a physician assistant here at the Cleveland Clinic in Western Florida. And today we're gonna to go over our class for patients that are gonna go through total joint replacement, whether it's a hip replacement, knee replacement. So the goal of this class is to optimize the success of your surgery, um, to get you prepared, uh, to go over everything that you need to know before surgery, during surgery, and after surgery. So we're gonna learn about uh, your total joint replacement. Um, this is an elective surgery, so we can plan uh, beforehand and get everything ready for what you need to have a successful outcome. Uh, and also you wanna prepare yourself as well as your family and friends uh, what to expect. So the overview of this is, uh, this is to form a partnership between you and our team. Um, it's, we're a big team where we have nurses, physicians, physician assistants, and we're all here for your care. So um, putting it all together with, with your family and your team, um, it's a partnership. So we wanna promote a safe and quick recovery. Uh, we wanna create an atmosphere with patient engagement, uh, which is critical to the success of your recovery. You wanna be involved in your care and make sure that you take accountability uh, for your recovery as well. So we wanna teach you how to properly prepare yourself and your home, um, manage uh, and understand what to expect um, for all phases of the surgery. So the team, uh, these are the physicians that, that are here at Cleveland Clinic, uh, Dr. Carlos Higuera, Dr. Pritesh Patel, Dr. Aldo Riesco, Dr. George Manrique, and Dr. Preston Greco. Uh, physician assistants is Christian Chiarelli, uh, Pedro Acosta, myself is Peter, uh, Kyle Buchanan, Kevin Perez, Selena Cavanaugh, Denise Jimenez Moore, and Austin Lane. So uh, these are the providers that'll be, uh, you'll be in contact during surgery, before surgery, during surgery, and after surgery. Okay, understanding your surgery. Uh, you know, compare, components vary based on your age, activity level, body type, uh, bone integrity, and also the surgeon's preference. So there's different components depending if it's a total hip, a total knee, or a partial knee replacement. So uh, with the total hip replacement, um, we don't use metal on metal hip replacements. Um, all our hip replacements are uh, titanium with a ceramic and a plastic liner, so hard polyethylene liner. Um, so if you look here, uh, there are four components to the replacement. Uh, there's the acetabular cup, which is made of titanium, and it has a hard porous, um, had a porous surface that your bone is gonna integrate into that. Inside of that cup, there's a hard polyethylene, highly cross-linked uh, liner, which is basically a hard plastic that's inside of that cup. Uh, and then the stem, which is made of titanium, that'll go into your femur and then a ceramic ball. And that ceramic ball with that plastic liner is what recreates the bearing surface of the joint. With the knee replacement, uh, there are four components as well, primarily. Uh, the femoral component is made of cobalt and chrome. Uh, then there's a hard polyethylene liner again in between the femoral component and the tibia component. And then the tibia is also made of cobalt and chrome. And behind the, the kneecap, sometimes they will use uh, what they call patella button, which is also hard polyethylene plastic. Um, and sometimes they will not use that, depending on how bad your arthritis is behind your kneecap. Uh, some patients um, will, will be, uh, the surgery will be performed with a robotic assisted, and that's on the surgeon's preference um, and the needing, depending on your deformity, if they feel that is, is best for you. Uh, partial knee replacement, there's different partial knee replacements. Primarily the ones we do is a medial sided, which is here in the middle, uh, and that's basically they're only replacing uh, the part of the knee that has the arthritis. So it's only uh, partial. Uh, the, the difference with this and the total is the recovery is usually a bit quicker um, as they're not uh, touching any of the other parts of the knee. So your ACL and your PCL are intact. Um, so it feels a little bit more natural for the knee uh, instead of a total knee replacement. 
Okay. What preparing for surgery? We're going to go over a few things: exercise, diet, assistive devices, pre-admission testing, home preparation, and transportation. So we'll go into all these things and break it down. Um, so first, for physical exercises, you want to before surgery, you want to maintain your mobility, your physical fitness, uh, and help for a successful outcome of the surgery. So. Um, you know, if any of these exercises are going to cause more pain, we want you to kind of back off. But we want you to do as much as you can before surgery and preparing for the surgery. So you want to condition your upper body. You're going to be using a walker. Um, so you want to make sure that your arms are strong um, and uh, you don't have as much fatigue afterwards. Uh, you can do walking or water exercise program uh, to increase your endurance and your flexibility. Um, or strength after surgery. These are some exercises that uh, we recommend for circulation. You can do this before and after surgery as well. Um, the first one is ankle pump. So as you just kind of um, move your ankle up and down and this increases the blood flow to your calves. Uh, the quadriceps uh, sets are when you're laying down and you push your knee down and you make the muscle, uh, your quadricep muscle, muscle, if you squeeze that, you bring your leg down, that also increases the blood flow to your quadricep. And then lastly, the gluteal sets. So if you squeeze um, your gluteus muscles um, firm and release, firm and release, and uh, that also increases blood flow. So these are all circulation exercises you can do before and also, uh, especially after surgery, you want you to do these. The next thing we do is diet. So, um, Diet is important for uh, your recovery and surgery. Um, leading up to surgery, you wanna make sure that uh, you're at optimum health for your recovery. So you wanna make sure that you're having enough fluids, uh, increase your protein stores, your fiber, eat iron-rich foods, lean red meats, protein shakes, and increase your vitamin C intake. Um, these are some of the things that have that uh, good source of iron, chicken liver, protein shakes, lean red meats, uh, clams, oysters, fortified cereals, rich bread and pasta, dried bean and peas, dried apricots, raisin prunes, green leafy, leafy vegetables, uh, edamame, other sources of vitamin C, oranges, orange juice, cantaloupe, tomatoes, broccoli, potatoes. So you wanna incorporate all these things in your diet. Um, one thing here is the caution with Coumadin with the green leafy vegetables. If you're on Coumadin, that may affect your INR. So you want to be careful with that. In terms of assistive devices, um, you'll be using a walker for about a week to two weeks after surgery. So uh, we want you to get, the one we want you to get is the one on the left here that has the, the check mark. It's just a two wheeled walker. Um, you don't need to go with a fancy Cadillac one on the on the right side. Um, one is for safety. We don't want this to roll away when you need it. And two, it's only short term, so you don't need to go spend a lot of money for uh, expensive wheeled walker. A commode. Um, this is optional. Some patients don't need this. Uh, if you have a very low toilet seat, uh, you may want to get this. Um, you know, for the shower, the toilet but it's not a requirement. So this is something that uh, depending on your, um, what you have in your home, if you need it or not. Okay, in terms of what you need for surgery in terms of pre-medical clearance, uh, all patients need to have the, the clearance depending on your history. Um, you may need a cardiac clearance, pulmonary clearance, but main clearance that you'll need is your primary clearance, um, which will be, uh, they'll do basic labs, chest x-ray, EKG, uh, those type, type of things. And you wanna do that uh, within a month of surgery. So we wanna have that at least 21 days prior to surgery in case uh, you need any extra tests that you have enough time leading up to surgery to be able to get that, that done. Um, you also wanna make sure that your medications are up to date, um, saying all the dosages and the frequency and when you take those. It's very important uh, for after surgery to, to 
have the continuity of your medications to make sure we're giving you the right medications. We need to make sure that we have that list um, correct. Some other testing, um, the preoperative testing is going to lab work, um, your analysis, the nasal swab. So we check for, before surgery, we check for a bacteria called MRSA. Uh, so we do that preoperatively when you're in the clinic, make sure that you're, you're not MRSA positive, which is just a, a bacteria that is resistant to antibiotics. So if you have that, we want to treat you before. Uh, and if you're still positive, we want to use a different antibiotic. So we just want to make sure um, that you're not a MRSA carrier. Uh, chest X-ray EKG, stress test if indicated. Um, this will be determined uh, by your primary doctor or cardiologist if you need a stress test. Um, and like I said, different consoles, depending on your history, you may need a pulmonologist or hematology, uh, but that all depends um, on a patient per patient basis. So the things that we want to do to prevent infections, um, we do a HIPAA cleanse wash. Uh, this is over the counter wash that you get at your pharmacy. You can do this five days prior to surgery and you do it once a day. So basically you're going to wash uh, from your neck down, you avoid your genital areas um, and you make sure you do the area where you're having surgery really well, whether it's the knee or the hip. The other thing you're going to do five days prior to surgery is smear Puricin ointment. Uh, you're going to get a Q-tip and just put this in the nair of your nose uh, twice a day. So you just get a Q-tip, put it on the end, do one side, then flip the Q-tip over, do the other side. And uh, you do this twice a day for five days before surgery as well. We want to make sure that you're not smoking or drinking prior to surgery. Um, you know, if you do smoke or drink, this will increase uh, your post-operative infections. And if you are smoking, uh, we would definitely not have surgery. So um, we would postpone your surgery if you're still smoking. What happens with smoking is it constricts the, the small capillaries in, in your body, uh, the nicotine, then uh, since it's constricting the blood flow in the areas where you have the incision, whether it's your hip or your knee, um, you're not getting enough blood flow to that area for healing. So uh, there's uh, increased risk of infection and wound, wound healing issues. Uh, and we don't want to have that with your healing. It, it could be catastrophic afterwards if you have an infection with your joint. So we want you to be upfront with these items uh, because it can cause uh, serious complications afterwards. So this is for your safety. Um, we don't want you uh, drinking or smoking. Uh, drinking can affect you also if you're drinking significantly afterwards. Um, you're taking pain medications and the interactions with this uh, may fall after and, and you know, cause a, a periprosthetic fracture. So these are all things that can complicate your surgery. So we want to stay away from smoking and drinking. All right, we want to prepare your home. So anything we want to work on is uh, making sure that it's safe for you to go home. So you want to uh, move frequently things that you're going to use often, like the phone or remote control, um, where it's easy, easily accessible. You want to make sure you don't have any obstacles, uh, rugs, extension cords, foot tools that you're going to trip over. You want to make sure that you have enough of a path where the walker fits, especially from the main areas where you're going to be walking the most from the kitchen to the living room, to the bathroom, the bedroom. You want to make sure that those spaces are clear uh, for you to make sure that they have no uh, tripping uh, hazards. You also want to make sure that your tub or shower has a non-skid uh, surface where you could just buy those strips that kind of that are adhesive that you had so that you don't slip when you're in the shower. So uh, you want to sit in a chair. You want to have a chair when you go home where it's firm, that gives you good support, that you're not going to sink uh, down and have difficulty getting up. Um, also, you may have some restrictions afterwards that you don't want your knees going higher than your waist. So uh, you don't want to sit in a, in a chair that's too low. Uh, you can add a cushion or a blanket if you need to elevate the chair. 
Uh, you want to avoid sitting in rolling chairs. And that main reason is just because you may roll away when you're sitting down. Um, you can sit in recliners. Again, you want to make sure that you're not too low where you're sinking and having difficulty getting up. Uh, after knee replacements, you want to avoid sitting with your knee bent for long periods of time. So um, there's this example here. You don't need to get this, but uh, if you have this, it would be good to elevate your leg. Uh, it's called the knee buddy. Um, but if not, you can just put pillows to elevate your leg. But we never want pillows just underneath your knee. It would be underneath your ankle. In, in terms of uh, preparation for sleep, uh, for total knee, it's preferably to be in the first floor, but if you have a second floor, you can um, use the stairs. Uh, we'd want you to, if you do have a second floor, work with physical therapy in the hospital, let them know that you have stairs at home and they can work with you uh, in the hospital before. Um, and total hip replacements, typically you're fine with going up and down stairs. Um, If you do have second floor, make sure that you have handrails to go up up uh, the stairs. The pets, we want to make sure that you have arrangements made for your pets before surgery. If you need somebody to take care of them, um, you want to minimize your contact with the pets afterwards, especially around the incision. You don't want them to be sleeping with you or licking the wound. Uh, also, they can be a tripping hazard. Uh, they may get very excited and, and kind of uh, run into you, knock you down. So you just got to be careful. Um, like I said, especially make sure that they're not around your wounds, licking your wounds. Other home preparation, uh, laundry. Uh, you want to make sure that you have everything done before surgery. If you have laundry to do, your bed sheets, clean towels, clean linen. Um, that way, when you come back from surgery, you have nothing to worry about in terms of your bed sheets are clean. You don't have to make your bed, or your towels are clean. You don't have to um, go get new sets of towels. All that stuff kind of do it beforehand, so it makes it easier when you get home. The same thing as food, have a plan, um, what you're going to eat, who's going to make the food for you, um, if someone's going to come assist you to cook, or if you're going to have someone deliver food, um, maybe have uh, frozen meals before ahead of time. Uh, or short shakes or powder smoothies, but just have a plan for afterwards um, so that you make sure you're getting good nutrition. Transportation, you want to make sure that you have the transportation set uh, before surgery. Who's going to bring you to surgery? Who's going to pick you up from surgery? Uh, who's going to bring you to your appointments after surgery? Who's going to take you to uh, physical therapy if you need physical therapy afterwards? Um, Typically, you're not going to be able to drive for two to four weeks if it's your left leg. Typically, you drive after two weeks if it's your right leg after four weeks. So you got to make sure that uh, you plan for that. And also, we don't want you driving, especially if you're taking uh, narcotic medications. Okay, uh, 10 to 14 days prior to surgery. Uh, your pre-op clearance, um, your doctors will tell you which medications you should stop and when to stop them. Um, you want to stop all anti-inflammatories like Aleve, Advil, Celebrex, Mobic, all those type of medications 10 to 14 days before surgery, unless otherwise told um, by your physician, as well as aspirin. Uh, some patients uh, can't stop their aspirin. The cardiologist doesn't don't want them to stop. so. Uh, if that's the case, you can continue. Just let us know that you're still taking the aspirin. Uh, if you're on blood thinners, uh, like Coumadin, Lobinox, Pradaxa, Zerelto, Flavix, Eliquis, uh, those need to be stopped before surgery. So you need to make sure that uh, you get the correct information from your physician of when you need to stop. So typically, Coumadin is uh, five days before surgery, Lobinox. You can take it up to the same day, Pradaxa, Zarelto, uh, Eliquis, usually a couple, two to three days before, Plavix, about seven days before. So you need to make sure you have those instructions from your physician of when to stop those. Uh, if you don't stop those surgeries, uh, will be postponed the day of surgery 
because uh, it increases the risk of bleeding uh, during surgery. If you're taking uh, hormone replacement, you want to stop that uh, a month before surgery because that increases the risk of blood clots. Um, so examples of that are birth control pills or testosterone injections. Um, you want to stop, stop those a month before and a month after surgery. Uh, there are certain medications for rheumatoid arthritis as well that you may want to stop uh, several weeks before, you know, up to a month before. So you want to speak with your rheumatologist uh, to know when to stop those. In terms of uh, medications for pain, since you stop your anti-inflammatories, medications will have increased pain leading up to surgery. So you, you can take Tylenol for that uh, leading up to surgery. You don't have to stop Tylenol. Right, the night before surgery, uh, you want nothing to eat or drink after midnight. Uh, you want to try to get a good night's sleep. Uh, you want to be well rested. I know it's uh, you may have a lot of anxiety due to surgery, but we want to make sure that you get good sleep and and uh, you're fresh for the next morning. You want to set an alarm, the time to arrive, uh, your designated time, which uh, the surgical coordinator will call you a few days before surgery at the time that you need to arrive at at um, the clinic. Uh, you wanna make sure you shower and use the Hippocleans body wash the day before and the morning of surgery as well. In terms of not drinking um, anything after midnight, you actually can have fluids up to four hours before surgery. Uh, so if your surgery is, let's say at eight in the morning, up to four in the morning, you can have water or Gatorade up to four hours before, but nothing else, we don't want you to have coffee, juice, milk, anything like that. It would just be water or Gatorade up to four hours before surgery. The morning of surgery, we want you to arrive um, to the hospital at the time that you're told to arrive. Uh, you take any medications that you were told uh, by your physician to take, like blood pressure medications, you take those with a sip of water. Um, we don't want you to take any antidepressants that morning. Uh, you don't need to apply makeup, no jewelry, contact lenses, all those stuff. Uh, I know ladies want to look pretty for the physicians, but uh, you don't need to put makeup on. Also very important, make sure you bring your list of the up-to-date medications of when you take them, uh, how often, and the dosage. Okay, things that you need to bring to the hospital with you. Uh, again, the updated list of the current medications with doses, timing, and frequency. Uh, if you have a durable power of attorney or a living will, you want to have that. Uh, bring your license and insurance card. Uh, you want to bring a, a set of loose fitting clothing for after surgery or when you go home. Uh, you want to make sure you have non skid shoes that you're not going to uh, slip. Uh, also, you want to make sure that it's a, a loose shoe where you have. Um, you may have swelling, so we want to make sure that it fits after surgery. Also, we want you to bring in your, your two-wheeled walker, and then you'll use that while you're in the hospital for physical therapy, and we want you to have that uh, for when you go home as well. Uh, what not to bring to the hospital. So we don't want you to bring any more money, jewelry, or valuables. Um, you may need some money, so uh, have your credit card numbers available for your prescriptions to go home with. Um, typically, the pharmacy here will fill your prescriptions uh, before you go home. So you may need a um, credit card number to uh, pay for those before you leave. You don't need to bring medications uh, unless, unless specifically told to bring it, but um, you could bring uh, eye drops or inhalers. But other than that, you don't typically need to bring any of your medications. If you're on um, uh, blood pressure medications, all those will be um, given to you in the hospital. Uh, you also don't need to bring any toiletries. Um, we'll give you a toothbrush, toothpaste, all those type of things will give, be given to you here in the hospital. So outpatient surgery, what to expect? So. Uh, now, Medicare classifies all uh, these surgeries elective, the total knee replacement, total hip replacements, they're outpatient procedures. 
So there are some patients uh, that you may be candidate to go home the same day of surgery. This will be determined um, by your physician uh, prior to surgery. Um, all partial knee replacements are outpatient and you go home the same day of surgery. Uh, for the total knee and for the total hip, even though it's an outpatient, we will do outpatient extended recovery where you may stay one night uh, and go home the next day. Uh, so, in terms of the what to expect when you get here, you're going to go to the preoperative holding area. Uh, nurses um, get you ready for surgery, so they're going to check your vitals. Um, <clears throat> you're going to meet with the surgical team, with the anesthesia team. They're going to start an IV line. They'll start giving you fluids. They'll give you some medications for pain, kind of getting you ready for the surgery. Uh, the anesthesia will talk to you and let you know what to expect from the anesthesia, what type of anesthesia you'll be getting. Um, and in terms of anesthesia, most patients um, are going to get general anesthesia. Um, that's where you have, you're intubated and you have a machine uh, that's breathing for you. Uh, sometimes you'll get a spinal anesthesia, which is where you're numb from the waist down, uh, but you're breathing on your own. And then for knees and, and uh, total knees and partial knees, uh, we do a nerve block, which is a, a local anesthetic by nerve, which helps with post-operative pain. That uh, usually helps with pain for about 20 to 24 hours after surgery. So uh, we recommend every patient get that. Uh, we actually did a study, um, one of our studies that included not having a block, uh, and we had to discontinue the study because you know, patients were having too much pain. So we definitely want you to get the block before surgery. Uh, some physicians have uh, multiple multiple uh, operating rooms. Uh, so there's gonna be an overlapping surgery consent. Uh, and that's just so you're aware, um, you know, during surgery, your physician may leave uh, after your case to go do another one and they'll still be uh, closing your womb. So typically, uh, let's say you have two rooms uh, before the surgery. Um, when you go back, we're getting you ready with anesthesia, positioning you, um, getting you ready with surgery. The, the surgeon will be in another room doing surgery on somebody else. Uh, once you're ready and you're asleep and you're positioned, uh, the doctor will come in, do all the critical parts of the surgeries, uh, and then once the implants are in, he'll leave to do another surgery and uh, another surgeon or physician assistant will close the incision. So typically the, the surgery itself uh, takes about an hour, but you're not bringing about two, two and a half hours. So there's a lot of downtime between the actual surgery and, and um, the time that you're in there. So in terms of efficiency, um, you know, the physician can actually do two surgeries during that time. So, like I said, the surgery typically is um, about one to three hours uh, during during surgery. Um, family can wait in the surgical waiting room. Now with COVID, things have changed. You're not able to wait in the waiting room, um, but your family will be called and updated, uh, letting you know what you know when the surgery is done. Um, so it'll be about four hours before um, they can actually see you after surgery. Typically the surgery is a couple hours, then you recover a few hours, then you go up to the floor. Uh, once you go up to the floor, then uh, your family can visit you. Right now uh, with COVID, they're allowing um, one visitor a day uh, for a couple hours. So after surgery, when you go to the recovery room, uh, you're going to be there for a few hours. They're going to basically be, uh, be checking your vitals. They're going to um, make sure that you have enough oxygen. They're checking your blood pressure. Uh, they're going to be giving you pain medications. Make sure that you're waking up from anesthesia. Um, they'll give you blankets. You're very cold. They're going to be checking, like I said, your oxygen. You may, you may have some oxygen um, with the nasal uh, with the nasal cannula just to, to breathe. They'll also be, uh, they'll give you circulation aids. These are pumping your calves. Um, 
you may have a urinary catheter. Uh, most patients, we don't use it, uh, a urinary catheter unless you have voiding issues beforehand or if your surgery is going to be prolonged. Uh, but most of the time, you don't have a, a catheter. Um, you know, sometimes they'll have uh, a bandage around your whole leg if you have a knee replacement that'll go from your from your foot all the way up to your uh, thigh. After um, in the recovery room, then you'll go up to the to the floor, and a nurse will continue to assess you. Um, they'll be asking you to do your exercises with your your foot. They'll be checking um, neurovascular status. <clears throat> They're also going to give you a spirometry, which is this little machine that uh, helps you to uh, work on your breathing. You want to do this uh, at least ten to fifty times, ten to fifteen times per hour. Now, uh, what this does is it opens your lungs. Uh, many times after surgery, your your lungs collapse a little bit, and it's called atelectasis. Um, this sometimes can cause fever, so we strongly suggest you do this uh, to help open your lungs after surgery. And we want you to do this up to a week after surgery uh, when you go home. Uh, physical therapy is going to work with you. Um, most patients or some patients are going to actually get therapy the same day of surgery, depending on the time um, that you go up to the floor. Um, and we want you to get up and moving as soon as possible. If therapy doesn't work with you um, when you're up on the floor, make sure that you ask somebody to help you. We don't want you getting up by yourself, okay? Um, but if they don't get to you that day, they'll see you the next morning. Make sure everything is well and you'll be able to go home the next day. So both physical and occupational therapy, um, they're going to work with you and making sure um, that you're walking, getting out of bed, dressing, bathing, grooming. Um, they want to make sure that uh, you're able to perform these functions uh, before you go home. Um, they're also going to work on the exercises, make sure that you understand um, what you need to do when you go home. So we want to be as active as possible. Um, after surgery for, for a quick recovery. So post-op day one, so we want you to, to, to keep moving as much as you can. So um, you'll be visited by uh, somebody from the operate, from the uh, surgical team uh, early in the morning, about six in the morning. Uh, the fellows will be, the fellows are doctors that assist uh, the surgeons during the surgery. They're already orthopedic surgeons. Uh, physician assistants as well. They'll be rounding and seeing you in the hospital. Um, you'll receive anticoagulation medications. <clears throat> Typically, this is aspirin. One of the main risks of surgery is that you have blood clots, so we want to make sure that these medications are starting uh, on the first day after surgery. Uh, if you have a catheter, they'll remove the catheter. They'll be drawing labs early in the morning, uh, making sure that uh, your blood levels are good, your kidney functions are good. Um, they'll start the fluids and uh, they'll take away the IV the line uh, before you leave the hospital. So most patients are going to leave after one day in the hospital. If for any reason uh, you need an, another day uh, in the hospital, they'll be basically continuing the same thing. Um, nurses will be monitoring you. They'll be checking your pain level, giving you medications, therapy will work with you. Um, and the main goal is to get you ready um, to be discharged to go home. In discharge planning, uh, it's a it's a collaborative effort where uh, our team is getting ready before surgery and after surgery. Um, with the case managers. So uh, this is an elective surgery, so we want to make sure that you have the support after surgery. Um, this is not something that is an emergency, so you could plan your care after surgery. So you want to reach out to friends or family to make sure you have enough assistance at home after discharge. Um, and the case manager will set up the, the discharge afterwards for physical therapy, if the nurse needs to go. Those type of things will be set up uh, before you leave the hospital. And I so said, there's one primary discharge location um, we want you to go home, uh, especially with COVID now. We don't want patients going to nursing homes. 
Um, there's more risk of infections. <clears throat> Many times patients are not happy when they go there. Um, you know, they don't get therapy as, as much as they thought they would. Um, and the safest place for you to go home is actually, I mean, the safest place for you to go is actually home. Um, are you sleeping in your own bed, eating your own food? Uh, typically, uh, patients do better when they go home than, than uh, nursing facilities. So under all circumstances, we want you to go home, um, especially at this time. So if, if you can't go home and you don't have uh, the assistance, um, this surgery can be postponed. It's not something that you have to have right away. So we wanna make sure that all this is set up um, so you can have a safe recovery. Um, one of the things that we wanna control after surgery um, is pain. Um, so it's expected to have pain. Everybody has different levels of pain depending on, on the, the patients. Uh, some patients don't require a lot of narcotics, some patients do, um, but there'll be orders uh, for pain for pain medications, depending on your level of pain. So always communicate your pain levels um, with, with the nurses while you're in the hospital. Uh, the other thing that helps with pain is uh, ice. So we'll give, uh, with knee replacement, we'll give you ice machine that will be on um, after surgery and you can continue that while you're in hospital. Um, also the pain medications that we use are depending on the pain level. So some things will be like Percocet, there's oxycodone with Tylenol, Tramadol. Um, depending on your level of pain, there'll be different uh, levels of uh, medication. And it's normal for your pain to actually increase um, more after the second or third day, uh, especially with knees when the block wears off, you may have some more pain the second, third day uh, after surgery. So this is some of the medications uh, that you'll be needing after after surgery is a blood thinner, uh, pain medication, stool softener, and acid, and anti-inflammatory. So blood thinners, uh, this is mandatory. We want you to take this. Like I said, one of the risks of surgery is having a, a blood clot, which is called DVT. Um, typically, uh, most patients are going to use aspirin twice a day for a whole month. Um, if you have uh, a history of blood clots, or if you're on blood thinners, uh, then then we may alter that. But um, you know, this is on a case by case basis. Uh, so if if uh, you have blood clots, you might be on Xarelto or Eliquis or Coumadin or Lovenox. So, but you have to be on something to prevent blood clots after surgery. Uh, the pain medication, they said uh, it's common that you're going to need narcotics after surgery. So typically uh, after knee replacement, we're going to be prescribing Percocet. Uh, and you can do one to two every four hours as needed. So typically we tell patients start with one every four hours. If, if you don't need it at four hours, then you don't need to take it. Uh, but you want to uh, take, take it, take it uh, consistently at the beginning to make sure that the pain is controlled. You don't want to have to be playing catch up where your pain level gets to 10 and the medication is not uh, kicking in until half hour or an hour after, uh, and then you're just kind of constantly trying to catch up with the pain. So you want to keep the pain controlled at a moderate level. Once you see it's like a level three, or you want to take the pain medication. If you're not having any pain, like I said, you don't need to take it, but uh, you want to make sure the pain is controlled to be able to function and uh, do the physical therapy because that's the most important part is after the recovery is doing the physical therapy with the knee replacement. Um, these have side effects, mainly nausea, constipation, loss of appetite, fatigue, um, and it can be significant. So uh, we just wanna make sure that uh, you're aware of these and control these. We'll get a little bit uh, into how to control these afterwards. Um, with the hip replacement, uh, typically we use tramadol, uh, which is not as strong as Percocet. and with the hip replacement, everybody's different, but some patients don't even require narcotics at all. Sometimes Tylenol is enough, uh, but we give you uh, Tramadol and a few Percocet um, 
uh, in case you're having severe pain, uh, some patients require it, but for the most part, tramadol and Tylenol is enough with, uh, with a hip replacement. And the other thing is remember that uh, ice and elevation are the, the best, um, best, med best uh, medications methods for pain control. I will send you with a stool softener. Um, so Colace is gonna help with the constipation from the pain medications. That's what we're talking about, the side effects of the pain medications. So we send you with Colace. This is as needed. If you're not constipated, you don't need to take it. Um, if you're having loose stools, you wanna make sure you stop this. Now, if you're taking this and your constipation is not getting better, then all these medications are over the counter. You can take milk or magnesia, Marilax, uh, suppositories, prune juice, uh, make sure you're eating high in fiber. Uh, so all these things to make sure that uh, you're getting bowel movement. Now it's, it's normal sometimes to not have a bowel movement for a few days after surgery. Uh, but if you're getting abdominal distension where you're really bloated and not passing gas, uh, then you want to call us and let us know. And we're going to give you an antacid. Typically, it's uh, omeprazole, Prilosec. Uh, and this is going to help with the medication, especially because we're going to be giving you um, aspirin twice a day and an anti-inflammatory, um, which can <clears throat> upset your stomach. Uh, so you want to make sure that you take this. This is uh, just once a day. The other medication we give you is, uh, is an anti-inflammatory uh, like meloxicam. Typically now we're using uh, Voltaren, which is diclofenac. That one's gonna be twice a day. Um, again, this can upset your stomach. So we want you to take uh, the, the uh, uh, omeprazole with it. Uh, and you won't get an anti-inflammatory with some patients um, if, if you have kidney issues or if you're on blood thinners, uh, we typically won't give you an anti-inflammatory. Uh, for post-operative care, you're gonna get uh, a dressing uh, that's gonna be applied uh, during surgery. You wanna make sure that this stays on uh, for two weeks um, until you come back to see us. So uh, we don't want anybody to take it off. Uh, if somebody, if a nurse goes to visit or um, you know, physical therapist, somebody looks at the wound and, and they want to take it off, you absolutely tell them this does not come off. If they want to take this off, they need to call the physician and let them know why they need to take that off. So uh, we want to make sure that that stays dry and, and clean. So if you're going to shower, you can shower uh, those two weeks where you want to make sure that you cover it, uh, wrap that up so it doesn't get wet. Um, you may need to sponge bath, especially with the hip which is a harder area to cover. Uh, you may want a sponge bath instead of getting a, a regular bath. Now, if you see any uh, drainage bigger than a quarter, this is just a, an example of uh, drainage that you wanna notify if you see this uh, in your bandage. Now, on the, on the outside of the leg, you see there's a little bandage. That is a drain bandage. That one, if that gets drainage on the side, uh, up here, that can be changed. But this main dressing here, um, if you see uh, like that bigger than the size of a quarter, you wanna make sure that you call us. Um, we don't put any uh, lotions or creams on the incisions uh, up to six weeks. We also don't wanna go underwater, so no pool, bath, or hot tub uh, for six weeks. So typically after two weeks, we'll take this off and you can start showering without covering it. So the biggest post-operative concerns, um, the pain, swelling, constipation, blood clots, nausea, fever, uh, urinary retention. So um, we said pain is expected after uh, joint replacement and every, every patient is different. So depending on your pain level, um, that's how you use the pain medication. Some patients don't need it, so you don't need to take it. Um, typically, we're gonna give you a two week supply of medications, uh, but if you run out before, uh, you can call us. Uh, we do now have e-script where we can prescribe narcotics, uh, so you, get, you don't have to come to pick up the script in the office, we can call that in. Um, there's associated swelling. So again, 
the best thing uh, if you're having a lot of swelling and pain is elevate your leg. So when you're not walking or moving around, make sure you keep that leg nice and high, higher than your heart. Um, and uh, that'll help with the swelling. So again, swelling, this is uh, expected after, after surgery. Uh, people get really scared sometimes because their leg is twice the size. Uh, and that happens sometimes. Not, it's not gonna happen to everybody, but for some patients, uh, they do. Uh, you may have bruises, um, you have blood thinners. Also, they're manipulating your legs during surgery. So you may have uh, bruising, swelling, redness, warmth. All that is, is uh, normal and not, all that starts getting better. Um, but the main thing to help with this is to elevate your leg. Um, sometimes you may get, if you get too much swelling, you may get some blisters around the incision. Uh, if you're starting to get this, uh, you can call us and let us know. Uh, constipation, he said this is, uh, you know, one of the main side effects of the pain medications. Um, so these are things I mentioned before. If Folase is not enough. Um, you know, try prune juice, laxatives like um, Marillac, suppositories, enemas. Um, you can have these are all uh, over-the-counter type type uh, medications. So, so it's it's common that you're not going to go uh, have a bowel movement for a few days after surgery. So, uh, but if like I said before, if you're having uh, a lot of bloating, not even passing any gas. Um, vomiting, nausea, uh, if it's uncontrolled, then uh, call us and let us know. Uh, blood clots is one of the um, uh, concerns with surgery. So we wanna make sure we're preventing this. Uh, we wanna make sure that you're staying mobile. We don't want you just laying in bed. So we want you to exercise, increase your mobility. Um, <clears throat> the issue with the clot is it can travel up to your lungs and that can be uh, deadly. So we wanna make sure um, if you have any shortness of breath or chest pain, um, that you um, uh, go to the emergency room, call us, or go to the emergency room, call 911 if you're having chest pain and difficulty breathing. Nausea, uh, vomiting is very common after these medications, after anesthesia. Um, try taking your medications with food. Um, you can try. Um, taking an anti-nausea medication. So if you need, uh, we can prescribe Zofran if, if you're having too much nausea. A fever, um, sometimes it's, it's uh, common after surgery. One of the things that we want you to use is make sure that you're using that ins incentive spirometry is uh, what we talked about earlier is to make sure that you, you're doing that 10 to 15 times per hour for a week after surgery to open up your lungs. Um, if you're having fever, you can take Tylenol. Um, and if the fever is not going down with Tylenol and it's, it's above 101.5, then, then give us a call and let us know. But you can use Tylenol to reduce the fever. Uh, after after um, your surgery that you have a knee replacement or a hip replacement, we want you to, uh, to have antibiotics before any cleaning or any procedure um, dental procedure to prevent infections. So typically, um, you just call us and we call the, the antibiotic into your pharmacy. Any miscellaneous things? Uh, so many patients ask, can I fly? Do I need anything when I fly? And uh, you don't need any cards. Uh, in the past, you used to have to show that you had an implant. You no longer need that. Uh, you can just go to an airport. Uh, typically, they'll see the implant on the screen when you walk through security, and you just let them know that you have a hip implant. So uh, you won't have any issues with that. Um, if you need any forms, disability forms, FMLA forms, uh, just bring those or fax those to the office, and uh, we'll fill those out <clears throat> for the surgery. Uh, parking passes, disability parking, typically, uh, for a hip or knee replacement, you don't need those because you want you moving and actually walking. Um, but on certain cases, we do give them. Uh, if you do need one, just uh, ask. And this will be only temporary, it won't be long term. Also, you're going to uh, get some 
pre-op and post-op phone calls. So just <clears throat> to let you know, don't be uh, surprised when these calls are basically just getting you ready for surgery and also after surgery following up to make sure everything is okay. Um, we're also going to be giving you um, the therapists in the hospital, they're going to be giving you exercises to do uh, on your own. So you're going to have physical therapy that come and other days you're going to do this on your own. Uh, so we're going to expect you to uh, take accountability and and, um, and work uh, to get get the results that you deserve. Uh, you know, so everybody's everybody heals at different levels. So uh, it all depends on um, you know how much work you put into it, and and um, you know making sure that you do all the right things. So on behalf of the joint replacement team, um, I'd like to thank you. And if you have any questions, uh, you can reach us at uh, 954-659-5430. Thank you, have a great day.